Matunela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. He's going to talk about this uh, Congolese philosopher, Musai Kiel. Okay? A round of applause for him, please. Testing, testing. Can you hear me well? Yes. Speak up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, a little taller. So okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Hotel, everybody. The title of my talk today is uh, Kemet in the Congo, or Congo in Kemet, a paper in honor of Dr. Kimbo Dende, uh, Kia Bunseki Fukuyama. Uh, anybody familiar with Dr. Fukuyama yes. uh, in the audience? Um, this is a painting of Fukuyama, uh, actually, and these are some of his works, uh, African Cosmology to Bantu Congo, uh, Self-Healing Power and Therapy, and uh, Simba Simbi. I'll just read my introductory notes and then uh, we'll go from there. Detailed linguistic studies have initiated and confirmed the deep cultural unity of black Africa, which includes the ancient civilization of Chikam. Chikam is a Chiduba Bantu way of saying the word Kemet. And so I'll use Kemet and Chikam interchangeably. While connections have been made on a topological level between ancient Chikam and modern African societies, very few studies have been conducted that allow for us to make more concrete correlations and map precisely the presence of certain quote-unquote comedic concepts across the spectrum of African cultures. This presentation seeks to fill in some of the gaps by examining the works of the late Congo and Ganga, or master, K.K. Bonseki Fukiao. Tata, or Father Fukiao, is one of the few scholar initiates from the post-post-colonial movement who has explored the past to perfection within his own wisdom tradition in his native Congo and has provided counter-hegemonic discourses which have allowed us to get a better understanding of ourselves and the richness of African thought and practice through a Bantu Congo lens. Because of his privileged position as a scholar initiate of indigenous wisdom traditions, one that is historically related to that of ancient Kibbet, his texts, I argue, provide us with, a necessary cultural, with the necessary cultural keys that help us to unlock many of the philosophical mysteries of ancient Chikam, which are fossilized in the hieroglyphic writing script. This being the case, although the focus of his scholarship was that, was that of the Bantu Congo, Fukia was not a linguist and therefore would not have known that the same words that he used to describe Bantu Congo concepts were the same words the Kemites were using to describe their worldviews and cosmologies. In this case study, using the analytical tool of comparative linguistics, we locate the Kemetic goddesses Maat, or Kemetic goddess Maat, and the god Ra in Central Africa within a Bantu Congo cultural context. We seek to demonstrate the vitality of utilizing the Bantu initiatory texts languages and cultures as tools for interpreting many of the obscure concepts of ancient Chikana. The words of the works of Fukiao grounds us authentically in the African worldview and the Bantu Congo becomes a launching pad to speculate more systematically many of the ideas expressed in the ancient Kemetic wisdom tradition. And so I just get started here. And so he was born sunrise on April 9th 1934, and he died last year on the 29th uh, of 2013. And so, um, just to give you a preview, this word, unk, what we pronounce as unk, uh, which is a life personified, the name of a god, is actually the word nganga, which Fukiao was. And what I'm going to be doing is showing you how to pronounce certain ancient Egyptian words through the Bantu languages. And <coughs> and to argue that one, Fukiao could be considered an ancient Egyptian priest in many ways in one, and that his works, again, are 
uh, provide us with the cultural keys to interpret many of the ancient Egyptian concepts. And so we'll see how this plays out. But before I go there, I want to introduce you all to a, a linguist by the name of Jean-Claude Mboli. And in 2010, he wrote a text called The Origin of African Languages. He builds off of the uh, work that Sheikh Antijo and Theophilo Wobinga did as far as the reconstruction of a language filing called Negro Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a few issues that had to be worked out with Theophilo Wobinga's 1993 work on it. And he expanded it and refined that work. And this is what this is in the... Um, in this particular text that came out in uh, 2010. It's written in French. And so it's significant because uh, in the building of this Negro Egyptian language phylum, we come to discover that there's two main branches of this language phylum. And for those who are familiar with the ancient Egyptian language, it is argued in the Egyptological text that the Coptic language is the quote unquote last stage of the ancient Egyptian language. Well, through this analysis, we come to discover that Coptic is actually a totally separate language from a separate branch of the Negro Egyptian language phylum. And that we can see these two branches here called Bere and Bir. And they're, I don't want to get too technical because it's, it's basically divided by the way they accentuate the syllables uh, in these particular languages. But over here we have Middle Egyptian, Hasa, Zande, Amande. Next to it, more closely related to it, are the, uh, the Bantu languages. And this is going to be key because Fukuyao speaks or spoke a Bantu language. And Bantu languages are very conservative and they actually preserve some of the old pronunciations that we find in ancient Egypt versus the other languages where you know, we see Coptic and Wolof and Newer and, and other branch of Negro Egyptian. And so <coughs> those who are familiar with the script, the interpretation of some of the ideas and what we're going to be talking about today is going to be hinged on a reinterpretation of the phonetic values of these two glyphs. And so this arm glyph that we see here is usually pronounced in Egyptological li literature as kind of like an ayin sound, trying to um, align it with the Semitic languages. And this uh, vulture glyph over here, uh, they usually argue is a glottal stop, but we find out that um, through my analysis that the arm glyph is actually a K sound and the uh, vulture is a what we call a uvolar nasalized trill. It's an R type sound, a nasalized R uh, sound. And so this has major implications for a lot of the words that we're pronouncing in the ancient Egyptian language. And so just to uh, do a linguistic comparison, um, <laughs> Let me go back a little bit. So we can see, I don't know if this actually will show up, this particular sign here, uh, I've given it the H sound, and of course this is the nasalized R. And so when we do a comparison, for instance, of these, these words in the ancient Chicam or ancient Egyptian language, we see that they correspond in the Bantu with a K type sound. And so the word for you know uh, claw, hand, and paw, this is a prefix here, it's ko, I only do the first four, the document, uh, mu is a prefix, the nda is a prefix, but the, the root is ka for book, document, letter, knowledge. Um, to leave, to go out, is actually metathesis right here, and so the, uh, the R and the L, with well, R's and L's uh, interchange, but the K is uh, reversed here. Uh, this word for ring, we see it in uh, Chiluba. Chiluba is a uh, Bantu language in the Central Democratic Republic of Congo. And so we pronounce it in Coco. Um, and so we can go down here for flames. We see another variation of um, metathesis here for the word for uh, fire, light, heat, flame, bonfire, and glow. And we can do a whole series of these. And we'll see that that sound, which they're pronouncing as ion, is actually a K in these uh, conservative uh, languages. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from Fukuyao's African Cosmology of the Bantu Congo, where he's breaking down the Bantu cosmology. And in it, I'm going to show you where these comedic principles are in the beginnings of these books. And so uh, it's only by way of linguistics that we're able to even detect these, what has been deified in ancient Egypt, but the principles are still present in the Bantu Congo. And so, uh, reading from his text, a straight line 
He's describing the cosmology. And I have the key words in bold. A straight line, skyline, and longa, or a line with an empty circle, in bongi, in its middle is, among the Bantu Congo, the symbol of emptiness, a world without visible life. That is the emptiness in bongi, the world in which, excuse me, the world in its beginning was empty. It was an imbongi, an empty thing, a cavity without visible life. And this is the, the picture that you get from the text. So this is the imbongi and the, you know, the inlonga line in the center. There are, in the empty imbongi, active forces that can blow up. Where there is emptiness and nothingness, act there other unknown forces, invisible of course, Man's life is surrounded by diverse forces and ways which govern it like an imbongi. So he's telling you at first that the imbongi is empty, but then there's stuff in the imbongi that uh, has the potential to uh, blow up, as he would say. And so, you know, this is another part of the graph in which he shows us again, it's the imbongi, the imbonga line. <clears throat> A fire force complete by itself, Kalunga, emerged within the imbongi, the emptiness, the nothingness, and became the source of life on earth. That is, the Kalunga, complete force by itself, fired up the Mbongi and overran it. The heated force of Kalunga blew up and down as a huge storm of projectiles, uh, producing a huge mass and fusion. Kalunga then became the symbol of force, vitality, and more, a process and principle of change. All changes on earth, uh, all changes on earth, and by cooling the mass and fusion solidified itself and gave birth to the earth. In the process of cooling, the matter and fusion produced water, whose rivers, mountains, etc., excuse me, are the results. And so, uh, Kalunga, then the fire force, blew up and created these planets, stars, everything else. This is the, the Dharana world, the spirit world, uh, represented in this cosmogram. The world became a physical reality floating in Kalunga, half emerging for terrestrial life and half submerging for the su submarine life in the spiritual world. The Kalunga, also meaning ocean, is a door and a wall between those two worlds. Kalunga became also the idea of immensity that one cannot measure, an exit and entrance, source and origin of life, potentials. Uh, the principal god of change, the force that continually generates. Be because Kalunga was the complete light of everything it, in touch with the earth shared the same life and became uh, life after itself. That life appeared on earth under all kinds of sizes, forms, planes, insects, and other things. The number of infinite mass and fusion particles that remain hanging in the upper space constituted what are known in human languages as sun, moon, stars, which are in reality other worlds. Man is called to live in certain of those worlds. Kalunga, the principal god of change, is a force in motion, and because of that, our earth and everything in it is in perpetual motion. Man himself is an object in motion, for he is an around the path goer in his upper and lower world. For those who are familiar with ancient Egyptian cosmology will see a certain um, similarities with, uh, you know, Ra coming out of the Nun mm -hmm. and, and creating the world that we live in. So I want to introduce some key concepts. In Longa, line, in Bongi, the empty circle, Kalunga, which is a fire force, Kalunga, which is the completely complete being, Kalunga, the ocean and waters, and Kalunga, the principal god of change. In linguistics, there's a phenomenon called paronymy. And paronymy deals with, uh, especially in theological uh, circles, when the, there's words that sound alike, and the theologians will converge these words together and create deities. So what I'm arguing here is that in ancient Egypt, and I can find this all across Africa, which you think that a deity's name means may not be what it means. It may be a paronym to another word that happens to sound just like it. And so this is what happens with Kalunga. The reason why Kalunga is the fire force, a completely complete being, ocean, water's principal god of change is because they all build on a, a root, Lunga, but they all have different meanings. And so they just crystallize it and becomes the god Kalunga. If that makes sense. And so, <laughs> going to introduce a few concepts. What we call the Nun or the Nunu is the Mbongi of Central Africa. And this is the linguistic equivalent. It's not just a conceptual. <laughs> when we do comparative linguistics, it's a thing that we deal with called um, sound change. 
And so when we do the comparative studies, we notice, for instance, when we compare the Egyptian N and the Yoruba G, for example, that they correlate in this initial position. So you see Egyptian Nebet, Goldsmith, Yoruba, Akbede, Goldsmith, Nebet, Basket, Akbon, Basket. You see where the N becomes the G in these um, um, comparative examples? This tells us that in their ancestral language that there was actually what we call a nasal velar. It's a, it's a G with the N sound merged with it. So it's kind of like when we say sing, mm -hmm. and then in the dialects they split. So the Egyptian kept the N, and it merged with their original N, and the Yoruba kept the G. And so when we're comparing, you know, some more Lord Master, uh, also this W, remember that the ancient Egyptians didn't write out their vowels. Everything is a consonant. And so we pronounce it new, but it's not new. It's probably like N with a vowel in between and like way or something like, uh, you know, ZZ way, po. You know, that way has a vowel itself under it. It's not a U type sound. And so this is very important. Because when we compare these terms, for instance, like with the new, we can see that they correlate, they correlate with these particular sounds. So again, with the N, the G over here in Yoruba, N, G over here in Yoruba, N, G over here in Yoruba, this W correlates with B. B often turns into W and compared um, correspondences. And so in the Kikongo language, the language of Fukiao, the syllables are switched. And so instead of saying Agbo circle, they say Mboka, Mbungwa. But in Yoruba, it's Igba, Agbe, Gord. You, you can see the, the related concepts. And so when we get here to this new, new, this so called celestial waters, it, it correlates with the Mbongi. It's just reduplicated in Egyptian. But um, in the Basa language, it's totally Mbog, Mbog. And we'll get to that um, a little uh, later. And so it's going to correlate with a little bit what Dr. Uh, Faraji was speaking on earlier in terms of the quantum world. And so this word nun, or the mbongi, or imbog, is a word for cosmos, but it's also the same word for nation and family, society, belonging to an ethnic group together, group, species, genus, system, in these Bantu languages here. And this is the key word here, system. And so when you're looking at nu, you're looking at a system. And in uh, the Basa language, which is in Cameroon, we, can, we get a better understanding of this nun, or the imbog. Uh, it talks about even the smallest universe, or empty set. Remember that Fukuyao spoke about an empty set earlier, but it wasn't really empty. And so this is what they're talking about here, the mathematical sense, the almost empty, the universe nun, or the universe down to the barest essential dimension, the infinite set, the universe within the universe, the insignificant, indeterminate, the infinitely small, the universe of the universe. They're talking about quantum math quantum mechanics. They're talking about a quantum universe. And out of this quantum universe comes the phenomenon which we see, which was fired up by the um, Kalunga, which was the fire force. And so this brings us now to Ra. Remember this sound here is a K. When you say Ra, it's not really Ra, it's like Rick. But in the Congo, it's Nga. And so this K-A is a uh, prefix. Um, I don't have time to go through all of this. But the Kalunga, Karunga, Mulungu, Murungu, Kalanga, Itango, Katanga, Intangu, Ilanga, Protobantu Dang. This is how you pronounce Ra. And so when you're talking about Kalunga, the fire force, this is Ra in Central Congo. And so we can uh, demonstrate here. Um, remember, I said that Lunga was all these different words, which they kind of you know use paronymy and homonymy. And so we have Lunga here, the light, or make it blow or fire. We also have Kalunga, ocean. Um, Kalunga, I mean, Lunga here, a smithy, a forge, a foundry, a gale, a blast, a strong wind. We also have Lunga, perfect, complete. Um, and it's going to have some implications on the goddess when we get to there. But notice this root here, Lunga, to be exact, just, accurate, right, perfect, expire, fulfilled. It's going to be coming, we'll pronounce it in the Egyptian, to complete. But it has that K in the prefix. Kikongo Kalunga, complete. To tie bind. Kikongo Kalunga, to tie bind. Unk, when you say unk, it's really not unk. It's really Kanga. You can say Kanga Kongo. Um, 
in Kole, you know, for great leader, we say, you know, ah, like per ah, it's not really ah. This is a K sound and this is an R sound. So it's in Kole, in Kole, in Kwele, Kalunga, Kola, all of these different words. And so <coughs> this word ra is also, we know in the Yoruba language, is Shango, because the R and T sounds interchange. And the T becomes palatalized and becomes a shift sound. And these are some of the forms that you'll see it in. Because rock dealing with fire also deals with light and whiteness. And these are some of the kind of the semantic extensions. Um, <clears throat> and so now we get to the goddess mind. And so given these correspondences here, is it mind? How would you pronounce it? How would you? It's more like murek, mureket. Truth, justice, straightness, balance, and order. The M is a prefix. It's a prefix of abstraction. Most of the, the languages in the, in the Congo don't have the M prefix, and so only have the root, which is the R and the K sound. The T is a feminine suffix in ancient Egyptian. And so remember that line that we saw in the beginning? Karanga talks about, when we talk about Ma'at, posits that the etymology of Ma'at suggests an evolution from a physical concept of straightness, evenness, levelness, correctness, as the wedge shape glyph suggests to a general concept of rightness, etc. And so we see here, in longa, line, roll, foul, a swarm of driver ants on the march, a troop of swarm. In the Kikuyu language, runga, straight, chiluba, mulongo, rank, roll, line, series, many. This is where we get the word right from in English. This is borrowed by the Negro Egyptian speakers. It's from Proto Egyptian, excuse me, Proto Indo European reg. Move in a straight line, also to rule, to lead, to lead straight, to put right. The English word right comes from that same root. Same for regulate, regular, regal, correct. When you're saying the word right, you're saying the word mind, literally. Because they're saying it with the root, you're just saying it without the M prefix. And so there's many um, words in Indo European that are borrowed. Uh, from these African languages. The root for Ma'at is really an R sound. It's redoubled in, in Middle Egyptian. It's really and truly. In Chiluba, it's Lela or Lelelele. Truth, authentic, variable. Siswana, Ruri, truly. Yoruba, Ododo, Otito. Truth, fact, justice, equality, right, righteousness. With the Chiluba, now has the, the, the K suffix here, but they, they didn't put the M prefix. So it's Sia Leka. Truth, reality. In the Basa language, they actually pronounce it like in the old ways, Malega. So if you want to say Ma'at in a more modern sense, this is how you pronounce it, like in the Basa Cameroon language, Malega. And of course, in the Ki Congo, in Lungu, justification, justice, righteousness, blameless, completeness. Hotep, everyone. Sorry to interrupt the flow of this video, but during the taping, we had a few technical difficulties with the camera, and it did not record the last few minutes of the presentation. Therefore, I have decided to edit in the last few slides from the presentation and add my commentary here. So we will now continue from the part where we left off a few moments ago. To continue our discussion, as we noted from the last entry that we had above, in the Kikongo language we have Nlungu, which means justification, the state of being just, justice, righteousness, blameness, and completeness. It continues in Kikongo with Lunga, to be accurate, right, be exact, perfect, etc. In the Isi Zulu language, we have Lunga, become right, become good. Isi Zulu again, Utu Lunga, accuracy. All of these terms deal with, on one level or another, this concept of the reality of truth and reality itself, which uh, extends itself into justification, righteousness, and blamelessness to be accurate, to be good. All of these concepts are related. And all of these have this L or R, G or R, K root that we can see in all of these various examples. And so we will continue. On the next slide, we have a diagram that was originally created by Dr. Fukiao. And it talks about this concept called Kaninga, which is the balance. And so, just like in ancient Egypt, how your deeds were weighed on the scale of Ma'at, the scales also being Ma'at, we have the same thing here amongst the Bakongo speakers. 
except it is called Kininga. And that root Minga is our root Lunga, just with the L nasalized. And so it's all the same word. So we had the same concept using the same root as we find in ancient Egypt as it regards one's health during the ancestralization process. But more importantly, in this particular instance, this concept of Kaninga is dealing with balance also in health. And so we will see in the next slide the relationship between health and balance. And we can utilize the Kikongo variation to uh, speculate and interpret what was going on in ancient Egypt in terms of Ma'at also applying to human health. And so from the text Writing Nature Cultures in Zulu Zionist Healing by Rune Flick, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he states, in a study of Bantu healing rituals, Jansen sheds light on this when he argued that conceptions of health are captured in the notion of leading a balanced life. In Zulu, the root lunga, used in greetings, wishing people health and well-being, include the notion of balance and harmony with the natural and social environment. To reestablish harmony and balance is thus a goal of healing of the, of the healing process. In order to achieve the rituals focused on the manipulation of places and relations to living and departed relatives to achieve healing. And so again, this particular text is reinforcing that this, this word lunga, uh, the same root as ma'at dealing with the concept of balance, uh, also applies to health. And this is being, um, this is your overall well-being and also being in harmony with the natural and the social environment. So everywhere we go in the Bantu world, this root in this world is critical to its uh, indigenous philosophy and, and ontological perspectives. And so the, the last ending slide that we have here, you know, uh, the left map comes from Jean-Claude Mboli's uh, Origin of African Languages. And after his reconstruction, you know, he informs us of uh, his hypothesis as far as the flow of the Negro Egyptian speakers. And so as we can see, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Middle Egyptian branch is totally separate from the Coptic branch, but the Middle Egyptian branch comes from the same Proto-Bantu root as Bantu. And this Para-Bantu group of uh, Middle Egyptian speakers uh, moved up into uh, North Africa into what we now call Egypt and its close relatives are the Bambara languages the Hausa Zande now the Bantu languages of course moved south as we can see uh, the, the arrows going south and so they have dominated for the most part uh, the southern half of, of Africa and so uh, because the Middle Egyptian and the Bantu groups come from the same proto-parent these same terms you know we find inherited in these related languages and so these concepts and applications and the semantics mapping we find uh, virtually the same in these different traditions and so um, on the right hand side is a a a figure that was created by Dr. Jocelyn, I mean, excuse me, um, Jocelyn Jeffries uh, out of New York for a book, uh, uh, a translation work for uh, Dr. Muba Binge Bilolo. And so this is a sun mask that we see at the top here uh, with the sun rays on the face that is uh, for the Baluba people uh, for a death mask uh, that is given to a great chief or uh high priest or somebody of importance you know when they die and so <laughs> just wanted to uh, you know point this out in terms of the relationships of concepts and we find the same things in uh, ancient Egypt and so uh, I guess lastly lastly you know we have as an additional note the concept of the per unk and so Fukiao in many of his texts talked about 
uh, his places of initiation. So remember that this uh, so-called glottal stop here corresponds to K or NG or many other different sounds uh, in the related languages. And so the it's not unk, so to speak, it's kunk. But in um, the Kikongo language, we know that it is pronounced kanga or congo. And so uh, when we look at on the right-hand side, the early unk symbols were... Uh, written as or drawn as a tied piece of rope <laughs> and we see on the left hand side here the uh, house of life or the name of a college of priests which is called per unk or the house of life and so we see the drawing at the bottom here in the key congo they have cognates for word per but when they want to talk about a site or a location they use the word ku and so instead of saying ku ank, they I mean instead of saying per ank, they say ku ank or ku kanga, the site of initiation, the institute that folds, ties, and unfolds, unties principles of knowledge. And those who have my aluja, rescue, reinterpretation, and the restoration of major ancient Egyptian things, volume one from 2013, you will know that chapter eight I talk about how the ancient world. Uh, especially in Central Africa, used to write and code and decode by tying knots and how that uh, ancestral memory made its way into the hieroglyphs uh, of ancient Egypt. And so when we're, when we're talking about Unk, it may not be necessarily a house of life, but the house of untying and tying knotty ropes, uh, you know, which is just a sim symbolic of knowledge itself, coding and decoding knowledge. But there is a variation in the Kikongo language of the word unk, which is zingu. And that K sound was palatalized, as we can see with the I behind the Z sound. And um, it was palatalized into Z. So instead of saying, um, you know, unk, they say zingu, which is the Institutes for Life. Budula Biameso, I, I, I Enlightening Institutes. So not only do we have the, the word unk, in terms of its tying and rope feature, but we also have the word unk is, is meaning life, but in the more archaic form, the form that informed the writing of the ancient Egyptian writing script. So this is zingu, so we would say per zingu or impela zingu. And um, so these are the variations. And so, you know, on that note, uh, I hope I have connected for the listening audience many of the ancient uh, or what has been known in the ancient Egyptian concepts and their survivals in Central Africa uh, the home and the birthplace of the culture that eventually developed and became the ancient Egyptian civilization and so with this I give honor to Dr. Fukiao he has helped us to uh, he has opened our eyes to a lot of things and I hope that I have expanded his his work by digging deeper into his language and comparing it with themes that we find in ancient Egypt and uh, advancing the work. So I thank you all for listening. Uh, Hotep, and you have a good day. Peace.